welcome listeners you're at 109 right now give mike a call so we can get into a little catch-up conversation here let's give him a call shall we Hello. Yeah, what's up? So when we last left off, I was trying to explain to you that work of art. Uh, and uh, anyway, we recorded all that stuff, and that is on what is that? That is that could be found at uh, at IC Ten Nine website. It's called Mike and Larry Eat LA Episode Three. That's where we chopped it up. But since then, man, since then, that's been a, oh, it's over 12 days ago, man. Has it been that yeah. long? Yeah, two weeks. Wow. Last weekend. What's been up? What's been going on? Same old, same old. Stand out the way. You know me. Same old, right on. Shout out to Albert Diaz. Half, What's that? Half, one half of the uh, the Samo creator. Like, of course, Samo existed before them, but uh, Jean Michel Basquiat and Albert Diaz, some young kids, put their minds together and created. They created um, for a school project. They created a, a religion called Samo. It's like internationally, um, you know, popular. They write. They were back in the days. They were writing same old on had graffiti on the walls and stuff like that. And uh, Albert Diaz is still alive, and so he still he still writes the uh, graffiti. And uh, wait, he's a he's a uh, a man in his fifties or early sixties running around doing graffiti. <laughs> He's an artist. He's an asshole. <laughs> hey, Albert Diaz, I, I, I met him, I interviewed him. Cool dude, Doesn't man. make him not an asshole. All right. If, uh, okay, so let's say that you own a building, and your building is a fine dining establishment, and then some jerk-off comes and writes, same old on the side of your building so now you gotta spend time and money sandblasting that bullshit off and painting over it just because he wants to express himself on a building he doesn't own he's a jerk off <laughs> something knock it off he's a thousand years old running around throwing up tags he's not Beach Street hey tell me where his tags are I'm gonna write spit over him oh man I'm gonna go to New York just to spray paint spit over his tags everywhere I see it. It's awful. <laughs> oh, man. I hate graffiti. It's the, it's the biggest waste of time ever. They became famous. Did he? I thought he was uh, famous just for being friends with a more talented person. Alright. The, the talent part, you know, there's a brother whose video I watched. <laughs> How the kids? Yeah, can't you hear them? I they hear them. Screaming about them. They having fun. I have decided not to intervene in this particular uh, situation. That's how I am in the classroom. Yesterday, it, it was it was quite man. What was it? Uh, quite eventful in the class. And I was like, I'm not. I'm not even gonna. You know, intervene. So, what would happen? Well, at the end of the day, there was a. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay. I, I just remember. Okay, at the end of the day, there was a, a student who walked into our class and just sat down. And I think she was trying to get away from an administrator who was ushering her off campus or I don't know what was going on okay yeah I don't know what was going on outside the classroom 
Um, but she comes in the classroom and I'm, I look at the roster and I ask her for her name. And, and then I had students in the classroom telling me that she was in the classroom, that I needed to check the roster more thoroughly. And so this went on for, you know, a few seconds, 30 seconds or so as I'm checking the roster, asking her her name. And she's telling me I'm in this class. I'm in this class. And there's a group Did of girls. Did she tell you her name? No, not. She didn't give me a full name, but she she was more so. Oh, I'm in this class. Check the roster again. My name, I'm like. So you let them kids play with you. I would say, what's your first and last name? And they go, I'm in this class. I say, what is your first and last name? Uh, but, but, Mr. Witt, uh, get the fuck out <laughs> no, no 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 I'm not gonna be I, I don't use any profanity and I'm not gonna be gonna do? not gonna be on on internet on the on TikTok YouTube Instagram teacher uses profanity teacher fights student that, that wouldn't even raise to the level of a, a TikTok video you telling one of those derelicts to get the fuck out of your classroom that's nothing all right, but but here's what happened. So, someone from outside, the, the administrator, enters the classroom and he spots the girl, knows her name, knows that like, he's supposed to usher her or whatever. He's like, you know you're not in this classroom. Get out of here. So, she gets out. Now, <clears throat> I let everything Is go. A, a black or Hispanic student? Uh, if, if that matters... Um, She's, well, you're telling the story. Tell it correctly. She's black. Um, the administrator's black. Uh, the students I'm referring to are, are black. And yeah. All right. Continue. All right. So, yeah. So the gentleman, the, the administrator comes in and says, you know, you, you know, you're not supposed to be in here. Get out of here. So she walks out. He follows her. And um, the whole situation has you know, has uh, been alleviated, been solved. I'm good. But then I started thinking about it and I turned my attention back to the students who were convincing me, trying to, you know, be, they were fervent in their statement. Oh, she's in the class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's in the class. And I said, so you all lied to me. One of the girls in the, in the group turned and she said, well, we have to stick together. That's that's what happened, and I was I was just you know flabbergasted, blown away. I was shocked. Yeah, you invest too much. You should have been just like, as soon as she came in, uh, what's your name? Uh, get the fuck out. Get out of my classroom now. Go stand in the hallway. I don't believe you. How would I have said that without the profanity? The profanity is the best part. You can't use profanity like that. That's unprofessional. I bet you can. I bet those kids have been cursed that many times at school. Deservedly so. <laughs> okay. Now, here's what happened before that class. I had two other classes I was subbing for, and there were very few students in it. One, one class, there were three students in the class. The next uh, class had about seven students. And then, just as that class before the one that I just described where that student entered um, occurred, the, one of the students told me, oh, your, your worst class is coming. <laughs> he told me. And I was like, what? And sure enough, now, okay, I opened those doors in the classroom because, well... I knew that from what the student had told me that I was going to have a rough time with these students. And I wanted those doors open. I wanted administrators who were walking by to you know, be able to stick their heads in the door to say, hey, what's going on? Calm down, whatever. So that's what I did. And that's probably why that, that young uh, student walked right in because she saw an open door and just sat in my class trying to hide. What yeah, do you, you, should, you should lock it down. Like Attica, the moment, the moment that bell rings, lock it down. You don't want the administrators coming in. What if you're cursing at the students? You don't want the administrators coming in and overhearing you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm we were, not. We were in Saudi Arabia, and yeah. they were just 
stick you with like these horrible fucking subliterate desert people for like weeks on end. Cause like like when I would go away for like cause one of my kids would uh I would come back from uh maternity leave or whatever. Yeah. And uh, they would say, Oh, he's fresh. Let's stick him with the garbage for two weeks and it'd just be shitty hour after shitty hour trying to keep these derelicts awake that are getting put out the program. Right. Nah, you gotta, you gotta keep those doors closed. Hmm. The, you know, I, I did bring up Saudi Arabia yesterday and I told the students, I said, you know, the one difference between the classes here in Los Angeles and, and those classes in Saudi Arabia um, are the fact that uh, the students in Saudi Arabia were spitting on the ground and not in my class I, n- I never had that happen do you have amnesia it never happened in my class me and Mike talk about me and uh, Mike Love we used to talk about that shit that happened in y'all classes all that filthy behavior <laughs> they knew better that's... In World War Three, you spit on my goddamn floor. Wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I certainly witnessed. You know, now that they were they they must have had uh, chewing tobacco. Now I was putting the motherfucker straight the fuck out, fuck out of my classroom. Wow, they go teacher. They come in with food and shit, and like I don't really, I wasn't the type of person to uh, to uh, enforce rules just to enforce a rule. That was never, that's not my personality now. I'm a fucking security guard. My thing is, you, as long as you're not a bothering me and you're not egregious with it, like you're not supposed to be eating in the classroom. But what I don't see, I don't care about. I ain't gonna like check your pockets or nothing. But if you're gonna eat in my fucking face, now I get up and throw that shit in the trash, and they go, teacher. Throwing food in the trash can is haram. It's haram, teacher. I'm like, oh, nah, nah, he's super fucking Muslim. Throw that shit in the trash. Fuck you. Fuck your religion. It's haram not to listen to me. Mm. I, when I was there, I had, I had like, uh, I think I had like three or four things in the, in the uh, straight from the Quran that said, basically, you're supposed to be obeying the fuck out of me because I'm the leader of the classroom. Right. And I had, and like the first thing, the first word in the Quran is to read. And I was like, I'm your goddamn reading teacher. Mm. You supposed to be listening mm. to me above everybody else. Your whole fucking religion is about reading and writing and shit. Don't you all take pride in memorizing that uh, book? Every Muslim you meet, if you throw the uh, Quran into the ocean, all the Quran in the ocean, that's the only book in the world that'll come back because we memorized it all. Y'all niggas love talking that shit. But the first word is to read. So this is what we doing. Hmm. That's an yeah, interesting, man. that's an interesting so, little story about throwing the Quran in the in the ocean and having to come back. Because it, you know, it's yeah, memorized. What, what was that dude's name? I forget now. <laughs> Fuck. I had to, me and uh you remember they took uh the car away from me and Mike because we would never get it washed? So they made us right with uh shit. I gotta ask him what his name was. They made him uh uh ride with the Yemeni dude. The older cat? Yeah, what was that dude's name? Taha. Yeah, Taha. Yeah, we had to ride with Taha every fucking day and listen to fucking boring Taha stories. <laughs> and I'm like, he like way to cool because think about it, like the. He he, Yemeni. He he, he like uh, second, third generation Yemeni. No, he was born in fucking Yemen. He grew up in Yemen. He went to school in Yemen, up through college years in Yemen. Wow. And he went to uh, Detroit as a, an adult. So, but we working for the Saudi military. The Saudi military. The only thing they do is bomb the shit out of Yemen. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm like, don't y'all niggas feel a certain way? Right. Y'all, y'all helping these? I mean, now, mind you, mm. our students were so fat, lazy, and stupid that they weren't going to get within a thousand miles of anything responsible for actual war. But still. Mm. Y'all still part of the 
because I felt kind of a certain kind of way about it, but I'm like, shit, I'm American. Uh, I should be feeling that way about my own goddamn government. What right. we do. Well, Aiding and abetting well, uh, well, international by, white supremacy. Right, exactly. Well, by the time 2018, you know, two years in for me, it's the, the I guess, what is it? The smoke cleared and it just didn't feel right. I knew that this was a part of the um, military industrial complex. We were supporting a war. It was like, it was on when we were there. There were more um, fighter jets from Saudi dropping bombs in Yemen than any other time, I guess, recently. I don't know. I wasn't paying attention, but by the time 2018 rolled around, I was like, man, I'm out of here. I don't want to support this anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Don't want to, you know, I don't want this on my conscience. No, car. that ain't true. What you talking about? You got fired. They just in November. They, they purged like 15 niggas. They got ready. That's all it was. Nah. You would have stayed. No, 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 no. I wasn't, I wasn't fired. No, nah, I mean, I think that it was, um, I think I was talked into resigning, actually. <laughs> yeah, so they wouldn't have to uh, pay you uh, unemployment. Oh, they were, yeah, they were riding me. I, I got, I got into some uh, little tiffs and some situations, and it was like, yeah, all the signs, the red flags were raised, and it was like, there's the exit door, Larry. Yeah, and then I wrote a resignation letter. Yeah. And, they, and when you went to go uh, file for unemployment, it was like, this nigga was on. He right. Was, well, he's fired. Right. You got to pay. You never fight. You never uh, write a fucking resignation letter. Hmm. You always let them get ready. Because then they got to prove cause. Or just pay you. And if you would not have written it, and you would have just uh, said, hey, uh, it was the end of the I'm, contract. Right, it was the end of the contract. You could have just said, "I just let my contract expire and not uh, sign or not accept any um, um, extension of this contract." So you could have went to the uh, unemployment people and say, "Oh, I didn't quit. Uh, the contract was expired, and they they offered you to extend it." And I said, "No, mm. I didn't have to accept the, the extension for that same punk ass money." Well, it still weighed on my consciousness, on my conscience, because it was, uh, what, Jamal? I didn't give a fuck about no Yemenis, I'm just saying. <laughs> it didn't weigh on my conscience in that way. So I didn't give a fuck about it. I don't know any Yemenis. But the, the news stated that Jamal Khashoggi or Khashoggi was uh, murdered. And I was like, yo, this is a, a brutal dictatorship uh, under, uh, what was it, MBS? Yeah. Oh, but peep, peep game. A, the United States props that shit up. B, how many people did uh America literally snatch off the uh off the street and uh fly over to Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay for torturing? That's what we pay for. We mm. pay that a third of the money that you make goes to the military. A third of your tax money goes to the military. So whatever you pay taxes, a third of that money goes to the military to support shit like that rendition hmm. that's where they, they pick niggas up off the street blindfold them gag them and uh, send them to torture sites all over the world that's some that's some Soviet Union shit gulags and shit where you just disappear people but that's what freedom loving Americans support that's why all this shit is bullshit all them shit white people say to you is bullshit America's a bullshit country that uh, doesn't stand on any of the ideals. All that shit they say that America's about is not. Freedom, we like the 32nd freest country in the world. You can't do shit around here. Mm. So They talking about they don't like TikTok. These guys, they don't like TikTok, right? right. Why? Because the Chinese government can use it to get information right. on the whereabouts and the spending habits and the blah, 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 blah about American people. The FBI has a back door to the Facebook that they can get the same information without even going to Facebook and asking. They used to have to, have to go to Facebook and ask individually. Now, with the uh, I forget what security bill it was. Now they had to build a back door into their program so the FBI can come and go as they please. 
Well, they spy on Americans all the time. Uh, what was it? Uh, black identity extremists during the Trump administration. It was calling black people who, who had the temerity to uh, point out uh, what America really is like. I'm probably on some list somewhere. All right. Now, what about you mentioned Facebook? I heard a story about Facebook and how in Kenya, Facebook has, I don't know, boiler room type settings, warehouses. I don't know. They've got people sitting in front of um, screens monitoring the horrific, grotesque, um, atrocious uh, graphic uh, images and videos that are posted to Facebook so as to weed them out. And these Kenyans who are working there are being traumatized over, you know, extended periods of just seeing graphic image after graphic image and video, etc. And they even had one where uh, I think a three or a four year old child was in the room when a parent live streamed their suicide. Yeah. So what's your point? Well, my point is you mentioned Facebook. And that's a story that I I just heard on the, on the news. I'm trying to bring bring in some other uh, topics, you know. Oh. oh, okay. And that's something I heard about, like in 20. I don't know. I was in Korea 2012, 2013 when I heard about when I learned about um, Facebook and all the the graphic uh, content that we actually don't see that's filtered out. But to but for the the Kenyans to have all those jobs and to see all of that mess i mean that's i mean you have to eat well somebody's got to do it right but but to wake up in the morning to go to your job and then for eight hours watch graphic material like that i mean oh man that is like damn i don't know i think they happy to have them jobs man dude it's my worst thing you can be doing in kenya for money but the other thing is like like you said you know the america and its lies i mean we have we're we have this pleasant view of our lives and 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 everything but we we don't see the mess we're not even we're not even concerned with the 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 soft underbelly i guess uh i mean to have an empire somebody's gonna suffer like you wouldn't have the roman empire without having slaves in the mines to uh, dig out the uh, ore that they, use, that they use for the metal for their spears and their swords. It's always going to be an underclass of people who are doing, well, you were in Korea, what, what they call them, the PD jobs, dirty, dangerous, disgusting. They, they got to get done. Somebody going to do them. All right, let me stop the recording and then we'll come right back and continue. All right? All right. You don't have to go anywhere. I'm going to just stop it. So let me do a station identification and then come back. You're at 109 right now. right now yep so yeah Kenya and yeah America America and the American dream and the facade and it's so well here's what here's something that I think that I wanted your I wanted your input on so Tupac Shakur's um, biopic documentary by the Hughes, one of the Hughes brothers, is uh, it was released, I guess, sometime last week or maybe a week ago. Anyhow, I've been watching it. I love it. It's really uh, well um, produced, directed. The best commentary comes from these, uh, you know, these people and their firsthand experiences, firsthand accounts with Tupac. Um, anyhow, you know. Tupac is dead, but you know what? Tupac was a foundational Black American, American descendant of slavery. He was, he was, you know, an American through and through. But 
there's a guy named Jimmy Hinchman. There's another guy named um, Haitian Jack. You know, I've heard you mention this this title of Passport Blacks before. These guys were in America. These guys, you know, were uh, close to Tupac, and they they basically hurt Pac in, in some form or fashion. Uh, Haitian Jack was uh, on trial um, for the sodomy and rape of that uh, woman, and Tupac was the what he was the co no Haitian Jack was his co-defendant or something like this and but his co-defendant had a different lawyer and got a different sentence and and pretty much he got off free meanwhile Tupac had to serve some time behind this case and it was just bad for his reputation um today Haitian Jack lives in Haiti free man has money doing his thing and Jimmy Hinchman well I don't, I'm not sure about Jimmy Hinchman well I think he's free and doing some things but uh, what do you, what are your thoughts on that if what's any. the question well what do you think about passport blacks and you know foundational black Americans and our relations and 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 goings on can Well, I mean, you know, I'm anti-immigration off top, so I don't really believe. I think that anytime uh, an immigrant or a person from an immigrant group harms a, a foundational Black American, is an indictment on the immigration system. He shouldn't have been in the country in the first place. Yeah. So, like Jimmy Hinchman, Jimmy Hinchman is in prison. Okay. Uh, right now so that's good but like we have to pay for them and all of this oh wait 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 and there's one other example you know shine the rapper shine yeah another another one derelict that we needed out in the country (laughs) like it like it just it just immigration doesn't benefit black america so i don't think it should occur it's a net negative I am on the phone. Go sit down. Go go right there with your brother and sister. I'm on the phone. Um, Here's the topic. So I was arguing with these uh, these broads on Facebook because I said that basically the the new uh, talking point that uh, a lot of women have is they want a provider male, they want a a, uh, a man is masculine energy. Basically they just want a dude to, 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 to pay for things. They want to in my opinion, they want to be able to go to work and then take all the money they make and just fuck it off on uh, on idiotic luxuries like uh, pedicures and manicures and Louis Vuitton purses and crooked wigs or whatever else they, they spend their money on. And my point was, I'm for provider males, provided that the woman is between 18 and 21 years old. She's thin, she's nice, she's childless, she's debt free, and she's completely obedient. Those women I can see getting a provider male that takes care of them. These other women are just wayward uh, 304s. <clears throat> what do you think, Larry? <laughs> Um, I see your point you know um, I think that there's a, I think there's just a lot of trauma and a lot of uh, what is it um, not misinterpretation but there's a mm, a lot of misinformation I don't think a woman should make any demands on a man if she's not uh yeah, if, if, if like you said, if she doesn't have that profile, um, yeah, leave leave the dude alone. Um, yeah, see, my opinion is, I don't think, uh, like, uh, like if I had to do it again, like I got married, I think my wife was like, 
How old was my goddamn wife? 31, 32, maybe. I'd have to really sit down and think about her. Uh, but I don't think a man should marry a woman that's over the age of 20. Because what is she doing in her 20s? Well, Running around, throwing pussy around to random dudes. And then she hits 30, and now she wants to get married. So she either has uh, a vagina full of disease, a bunch of uh, emotional baggage, or some other dude's kids. And most of these bras have two or three of those things. All right, wait, Some wait. Some of them have all three. Let's, let's, we're international here. We're international brothers. So from an international perspective, let's look at from, let's say if we were, if Mike and Larry were from, if we lived in other countries. We what, have what lived in other like? countries. Right. And so, okay. All right, we're in Saudi Arabia. We're young, you know, uh, 17, 19 year olds in Saudi Arabia. Are our counterparts, our female counterparts, are they running around having sex? No. And, uh, but guess what? They're getting married pretty young. Okay. What, like, here's the thing. Uh, depending on the family, depending on her personal uh, level of beauty, she's getting married at 18, 19, 20 years old. She never left her father's house. She never been kissed. She never been seen by an outside male. Okay. She is pure as it can get. All right, now but, let's. But but uh, in America, you marry some thirty-year-old uh, chick, she got sixty bodies. Who wants that? It's almost kind of disgusting. It's actually marrying an American woman is similar to marrying a, a prostitute in Thailand. If you just go body for body, and their behavior is so disgusting, they won't even fully discuss it with you. Ask the woman what her body count is. She won't tell you because her behavior is uh, embarrassing to her. Whoa. If you stand on your womanhood and you wear your panties or whatever uh, 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 slogan you got to uh, uh, to talk about uh, how you can be sexually free, then why you why you uh, so not forthcoming with the number? And yes, I'm a stranger, so you got to tell me. But the dude you want to marry, he don't get to know the number. Mm. I knew my mother's number was one. All right, so Saudi Arabia, South Korea, 17, 19 year old in South Korea. What about that situation? Okay, so the South Koreans. The South, a South Korean woman lives with her family up until the time that she gets married, uh, if at all possible. Now, let's say she's from uh, Busan and she needs to, she got into Seoul University. Okay, well, then now she'll go live maybe in a, uh, a small apartment or whatever by herself or whatever. But they're not running to 30, 40 dudes over there. And as soon as she get uh, done with school, she back at her, her daddy's house waiting on her husband. Mm. Mm. And they get married at 30 because it takes that long for the man to put together his resources to be able to uh, afford a wife. But they got a plan. They got a, uh, a, a way of going about this. Yeah, Our way is uh, she should have her full. She get uh, she gets to fuck off for twelve or thirteen years, and you got like celebrities endorsing this shit. Like Gabrielle Union was saying that to uh, Steph Curry's wife. She shouldn't have got married so young. She should have been for what? Uh, throughout history, most women got married between the ages of thirteen and fifteen. I was having women arguing with me that nineteen is too young. Too young to do what? But you, you wanted to go out and uh, knock off uh, the, the spring line of Kappa Alpha uh, sign? Is that, is that what it was? You needed more time? Well, here's an example of how devolved American society can be. Like, I was in class and I, on the board, I was searching for an activity, a topic. On the board was a question that had been posed <laughs> earlier previously in in some other classes and i was just following up to get some ideas going and the question was about human trafficking and i the question was something to the effect uh what is human trafficking and uh what are the laws against human trafficking there was a a student in the classroom who raised her hand and told all of us 
that human trafficking was illegal that you can get life get a life sentence and and she basically ran down what human trafficking involved and then i asked her i said okay well dang that's a lot of information how do you know she was like oh my uncle's in jail for life for you know sex trafficking and what have you And that was an eye-opening experience to hear someone have a first-hand account like that. Mike, you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. yeah you know what? They kind of changed that law when I was in Korea. Because I used to go up, um, you know, when you were in Itaewon, they had Prostitute Hill. Yeah. And they would stop you if they thought you were like a uh, soldier's age. And they would give you that um, It was this, um, like, car they had the military rules on it against human trafficking. I forget like the, the subsection or whatever under the uniform code or justice or whatever they call it. But it was like a whole section about like they could absolutely not be with a prostitute because any sexual contact was considered human trafficking. Wow. It was real weird. Well, yeah, but I, I no. Those in a way, kind of okay with that okay. I'm not really for the overreach of, of American rules and government and all of that and, but then again you know like people do get snatched and yeah. put into bad positions and I think those dudes should go away for jail for life if you like you know moving women around to, to uh, sell ass on your behalf I think that's wrong yeah, and but I then can't. again, like regular old school pimping, I'm okay with too. <laughs> so I'm sort of conflicted. I was I was listening to the pimp uh, named Sharp. On um, he had his it was actually the soft white underbelly uh, interviews, and Sharp was talking about his life, and he was talking about the American dream and how his life and the American dream, you know, how there's such a disparity, such a divide. Like that 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 was all a lie. Well, when I was uh, about, oh, maybe I was like 20 or 21, I used to drive for this pimp. And wow. my job was to, uh, to, to what do you, yeah, everybody out. I was yeah. All right, so I used to drive for this pimp and my job was to pick the girl up, take her to the motel, Whoa! Sure that, what? This what? is this is wild. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm, I'm listening, but this is wild. Wow. Okay. Okay. So the way I got this job was uh, it was even like the Free Times in Cleveland. We had like two um, alternative newspapers. It was either Free Times or the Cleveland Scene back in the day, and it was like an advertisement for like a driving job. So I called a dude, and my mother had died, and I got the. Um, her blue station wagon, you know, I just got it. So I called him. He was like, yeah, I just need you to pick up uh, these girls and take them to the appointments or whatever. So I already knew what it was. Oh, so wow. so, he was, uh, so he was on the... First night I get up, these two black crackheads or whatever, they get in the car. I take them. It's this uh, fat Arab dude or whatever. I come to find out that he owned like the, the local great steak escape. And I'm uh, in like the downtown mall. That was his. That was his business or whatever. But anyway, I dropped them off. They did what they do. They get back in the car. It was like uh, take them to the crack spot. I take them to the Woo. crack spot or whatever, and they give me a little tip. And that was it. And I did that for months. Woo. Then I found. Then I figured out. Well, I can just buy crack and sell it to them. <laughs> then, you know, cut out, cut the, out the middle man. Middle man. More profit for me. <laughs> So oh, man. I would sell, I would just, you know, I would get crack to my friends or whatever, and I would just sell them that crack. So they, they, that was, it was more convenient. Oh they my gosh, me. no, man. You did that? Oh, yeah. Tupac, in his story, they were saying that Pac sold crack for like five days, and his empathy levels couldn't uh, uh, allow him, wouldn't allow him to, you know, hurt his people like that. And that's what his buddy Ray Love said. And Ray Love had the same situation. He said he, he sold it for about seven days and then 
you know empathy he was like man i can't do this and what they said uh, that really you know resonated with me is that in a capitalist society your empathy levels have to be extremely low in order for you to i guess prosper yeah i mean shit <laughs> It, uh, what, what was that in the uh, beginning of the Godfather? Uh, behind every great fortune, there's a crime. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, it's, it is. Somebody gonna get hurt. <laughs> Cause like, oh man. For for like, if you want to have a just society, then we all in small villages, bartering and trade. That's it. That's that's the fair way to do it. Whenever you're trying to amass uh, excess resources and then hoard them, yeah. Now it's gonna be a problem. Yeah, like they were saying, like it was some scientist. He was saying, if we if we went to a village and there was a monkey who had a hundred bananas and a hundred and like ten other banana monkeys that didn't have none, we would say there's something wrong with that uh, monkey. But under capitalism, <laughs> he's, he's acting appropriate. <laughs> right on. <laughs> that's a that's an apt uh, analysis and like oh, you can't man. have a man with 140 billion dollars yeah and because there's only so much money so if one man has 140 billion you got to offset that someplace so you're gonna have to have 20 30 million people with none 100 a uh, 100 million people with none with nothing ah. so every time jeff bezos or or uh or, or elon musk they get another ten billion dollars. That ain't coming out of thin air. The pie is only the pie doesn't get bigger. It only moves around. And our pie, like during the uh, during the uh, COVID uh, time, they were saying that the the, the top one percent got like thirty three percent richer because they own everything already. And when you gotta sell resources, you gotta sell it to them. Hmm. They're the only people with uh, capital like that. Well, well, back to you. So your empathy level is low. At least for I would say a few it's months. low. We all street people. I was I was uh, damn near homeless at the time. Uh, I used to sell my plasma for money. Uh, I would sell my plasma, and then uh, across from the street, it was on West Twenty Fifth, uh, and, and, uh, and, and on the west side of Cleveland, uh, there was a plasma center, and you would go there. And the girls would do your, the phlebotomists would do the, the blood, the, the plasma draw really slowly. Because if they did it really fast, you actually made more per hour than they did. So they were like Whoa. very vindictive. And they would, they would like make you wait extra hours. So I would do that. They, the first blood draw a week was uh, $15. Now, mind you, I don't know how much they got for that plasma, but I'm sure what I sold for $15, they probably made 10000 on it. They made at least a thousand on it. Wow. So, and only people that, that, that sell plasma are poor people. Poor black people, poor Hispanic people, poor white people. I ain't never seen nothing in a plasma center other than that. So you go to the lowest people in society to literally take their blood plasma for them. You pay them next to nothing for it. Like if you did it twice, I'll get $15 the first time. They give you a check too, by the way. These ignorant motherfuckers get a poorest people in society checks. But anyway, so sometimes I had a, a bank account, but some people had to spend like two or three dollars just cash this bullshit check. Wow. But anyway, uh, the, the first uh, the first one was fifteen, and the second one was twenty five. But you had to do it because you had to wait, I think, two or three days in between. So you would have to do your first one by Tuesday if you wanted to be able to come back on Saturday to get it for the same week. It was a whole thing. Or like Sunday. It was, it was a whole thing. But it was, I remember it was $40 a week. So I used to do that for gas money and shit. Uh, I survived for uh, months on uh, quarter crackers and a gallon of water. I learned how to eat on $8 a week and shit. So it wasn't about like exploiting these women. They they was doing it regardless. All I was doing was providing a, a ride, just like the bus driver. Now the settlement some crack part. You could you could argue that was exploitative, but 
shit, people will go buy beer to get through the day too. Does Amheiser Bush feel guilty? <laughs> people go to a bar. I know my uncle owns a bar. He got regulars that come in there every day uh, for a, 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 a shot and a half or whatever. Mm. People got to do what they got to do to get through. Wow. Especially like get me to the middle class and then judge my morals. If I'm, a, if I'm in the gutter and I'm trying to survive, you, you ain't in no place to judge me. I ain't even where you at. I, if, if, you, if, the, if you got a clean, comfortable home and the lights is on and there's food in the refrigerator, you can't judge somebody that's, that don't have those things or what they got to do to get to those things. Now, what, how do they behave once they have them? So we like to point, uh, as a society, we'll point the finger at, at the animalistic natures of these street thugs and all of this from the from the comfort of white suburbia. Right. Artificial white suburbia. Yeah, that's true. You know, where I was growing up, where I live, right across the street from Yeah, beautiful ball of <laughs> yes. Where the the J Beautiful. Listen, I was in the classroom and um I was talking to a young man and I was like, come on, man, you know, get the pencil out and do your work or whatever. And the, the young brothers looked at me and they were like, where are you from? You know, what, what, who are you? What is this? And I'm like, look, man, I'm from right here, right here with you. And they were like, what? And I pointed in the direction of uh, where we live because of the school where where I work is just right down the street from you know our home. And I said, I lived right over there on those hills. And the young brother turned to me and he was like, oh, so you were looking down on us. And I was like, he had a point to some, you know, degree, but also I wasn't looking, I wasn't looking down per se. I was looking for understanding because they certainly had my attention from Snoop to Quick, like... I was I was there to understand and I definitely wasn't uh willing to put my life in danger to like go there physically go into those communities to be like so what why do you guys do the things that you do um but I, I don't think I was I don't think I was I was uh as judgmental as as he made it seem you know I was you know Oh I'm judgmental as fuck on uh older ass gang banging niggas cause after a certain point you gotta um, also become a man you gotta live your life with a certain amount of understanding and like scraping around at whatever age is one thing but now you 30 40 years old you perpetuating bullshit you shouldn't be able to talk to a, a, a 40 year old uh, man about gang banging now you should be like what that's for children all of it's childish and the one thing that gets me though about about this the the gang aspect is some of these folks come from like decent homes and i don't know if it's uh i don't know what it is but that makes them you know act out i i think it might be out of boredom there's one kid in in the class who was uh claiming to be a rival gang member and i'm like that could not possibly be true because it's a class full of your rivals and and they're not you don't think they're gonna do anything it, i don't know what he was what his you know mo was but um and then to look at some of the homes i mean of course in los angeles there's like 80 percent um apartment you know residents very few people own their homes but um there are some homes around there and i think that the the kids do come from you know decent homes but then there's that i don't think i I guess it's boredom and it's a it's a desire to belong and 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 other aspects you know uh awkward teenage years that you know pushes them in the direction to be like i think i need to i think this is what i need to do you know even impressing girls you know sticking out one's chest and hey I'm, i'm tough and i can do this and that <clears throat> I might be part of it, but well, I mean, it's it's uh, 
everybody has socialization. Like we worked in Korea, those kids were socialized in a specific type of way in, mm-hmm. in terms of like their socialization was uh, extreme academic achievement. Right. And so they will push themselves to 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Our kids have uh, a socialization towards de- degenerate behavior. <laughs> Whorehouse uh, culture. Yeah, so it's a whorehouse culture uh, with uh, whorish mothers and lack of fathers, mm. and the fathers that uh, and and the, and the mate selection of the fathers because uh, in our community we don't select for uh, intelligence or hardworking or thrift or anything. And that is, you know, who the cutest nigga with the biggest dick. And so you produce uh, these children uh, with those traits. All right. How you, how you gonna, how you gonna uh, like? And even even when even the, the the production part isn't that big a deal because you can take those kids out of those homes and put them in a different environment and they will still come out different. So socialization is even more important than the genetics of it all. But it's. You can't have backwards breeding and uh, bad socialization, which we have both. And that's why I'm saying, to my original point, an 18 to 20 year old girl should be getting married to the most responsible black man that she can find. And she should offer her virgin womb and her uh, her unsullied mind to him and her beauty in, res- in, in, in exchange for having uh, a secure place to raise her children. It's a secure uh, home environment for her to live in. All right, I'm gonna end it on that note. This uh, this segment here with a station identification, we'll come right back. You're at 109 right now. Right now. Go. Yeah, well, that's the record start initiation uh, sound. Okay. So let's see, what else can we talk about? Lorenz Tate. Oh, man, I'm getting huh? a call. I'm getting a call right now. Uh, you hear that? Yeah. All right. Well, let me see what's going on. I'm on the. I'm recording. I'm on the phone with a uh, mic right now. You're you're recording now too. I think. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Yep. Hey everyone, just wanted to pop in and say hello. Okay, I'm out. <laughs> Peace, bye, Zeus. Say hi to Big Mike. Hi, Big Mike. Hey, how you doing? I don't hear him. <laughs> oh, you don't hear him? <laughs> okay. Nope. All right. Well, I don't know if this is recording, so. Um, send me a message and yeah, I don't, I don't know if your if your voice is being picked up. So when this airs, then it'll, it might sound as if I'm talking to myself. I think okay. Mike's voice is up. So okay. got it. All right. Well, if they can hear me, this is part of the plan. Talk later. I'm out. Bye. All right. <laughs> Bye. You're at 109 right now. Mikey there yeah I'm here yeah this is kind of funny I'm not sure if it, if uh, Randy's voice was picked up but um anyhow um yeah I'll send her a message so he can yep but um Lorenz Tate man Lorenz Tate said about um the British uh, actors you know he said that he thinks that the British actors are um are favored in Hollywood and I thought about our situation in Saudi Arabia how they had us they had Americans working for their company and then they let I guess all of us go or many of us go and replaced us with Brits and I think that's because I think you told me that the Brits are cheaper and I think the Brits are cheaper they don't have to pay. They don't have to pay unemployment insurance for them because they're not paying into that system, and they can fire them easier because there is no real recourse. 
for them. They aren't American citizens. They aren't going to go and file anything with the uh, unemployment or the labor or whatever for the state of Virginia. And that scumbag company has now moved fully on to some Indian reservation someplace so that it, they can make it, they, it's even harder to hold them accountable in terms of uh, their treatment of uh, the employees. That's fascinating. But it goes to, yeah, it goes to show. Of like, uh, that's why I keep telling, I, I keep going back to this point that immigration has never uh, yeah. been anything but a, a way to undermine black Americans. Yeah. If we go back to Crispus Attucks, why was he on that dock? He right. was on that dock because British soldiers were undermining him for dock work. Mm. So even from before this was a nation, you've had immigrants doing immigrant bullshit. Right. And they're all, see, because whatever they get in America is a boon to them because they're just going to take whatever they get and then go back to their homeland. This is our homeland. We aren't going anywhere else. Right. And we, we, we fight for every crumb and then they come over and they don't fight and they under, and they disrespect us. That's the crazy part. Right. It should, it, uh, uh, immigrants should never be disrespectful of a uh, uh, black American. And that's what happened today, man. I'm, I went into, I made my video about it today. Um, I went to the store to pick up, you know, some uh, groceries or whatever. And the lady was taking my order because, oh, uh, well, the story goes, I walked in there. I was waiting for them to take my order. Nobody addressed me. I walked away, came back, and uh, there were two white women standing there. And a woman approached the, the counter to take orders. She looked at me to take my order. I began giving my order. And like in the middle of the order, she turned to the white ladies and she was like, nah, I think I'm going to take their order first. And I was like, whoa, I had been there before. This woman who was taking the order had seen me before. I was a regular, I'm a regular customer there, which I'm ashamed of now. Well, I've noticed these little, you know, micro What was the name of the store? is uh rainbow acres rainbow acres yeah uh what's the name of the woman i don't know her name i don't know any of their names why did you ask i mean like okay so this is how i would have handled it as right. soon as uh i would have felt some bullshit going on i was uh went up and i spoke to the manager and got that lady's name and said why is why am i being treated like this way i came to the counter first she didn't acknowledge me these two white women come up, then she comes over to uh, finally do her job. I'm here first. Uh, my order should have been taken, but she decides based on uh, I, racial preference, I don't know, to take their orders. Is, is this how your business does this, uh, goes about its business? No, I didn't, I mean, okay. I didn't, I wasn't working with it, you know, as intricately and I didn't have the energy to go into it and it was, it, it, there could have been some other things to it because you know it was it was busy i approached the the counter the lady behind the counter first lady was was busy i walked away i came back to a new situation and the new situation what looked as if i was approaching the counter second but but well you did approach it you walked away and then other people right. approached Right. And then they, 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 somebody else came up to do the, uh, the business or whatever. You walked away. That's true. All of that is so true. So you should have stood there. Or you should have got somebody else's attention. Or right. said, is there anybody else working here? Right. Which is why I didn't, didn't have, didn't, you know, make a, a, a uproar about it. But I thought about it and I was like, wow. She started taking my order. And then she switched and said, no, I think... I'm gonna I'm take their order, but anyway, and that's what I—that's my little pet peeve of the day. But but whatever. But here's the thing: just minutes later, moments later, I I went to the counter to pay for uh, my my order now, and there was a black man at the checkout counter, and he he made a comment about how the service that he was receiving was subpar and how they were just basically ruining his day <laughs> and i was like whoa so, so, so why do you niggas keep going to this store <laughs> it's obviously not black owned so it's obviously what's the point of giving these people money all right excellent question 
Like you could just not go here. Like yeah. niggas like the uh no, we don't uh, be victimized by poor service when you just not go to places. We don't Fuck we them. we don't. You know the thing about it is all right, it's the convenience, it's the the quality of the food that they serve. The well, quality. all right, then just suck it up then. I heard they Okay. Hey. Yeah. What happened? Where you where you at? Did I lose I you? I said uh I'm here. Okay. I said suck it up then. And uh what's the name of this uh this store? Rainbow Acres. Cause I'm gonna call up the Rainbow Acres tomorrow morning. I'm gonna say, uh, whenever you see a black person, write nigger on their order. <laughs> nigga one, nigga two, nigga in red, no, nigga no, in the blue no, shirt, no, no. nigga with the chuck song. That's cold. That's how, hey, you niggas don't uh, care how y'all treat it when y'all spend money. So fuck it. Let's let's uh let's go all out. That's terrible. I love it. <laughs> hey, I would ask you your name. Oh, what's your name? Your name is Larry. Okay, nigga Larry. Wait a minute. Now listen here, because as far as uh, in aisle three, nigga Larry, your, your order's ready. Oh, nigga Larry, shit. to the uh, counter, your order is ready. Man, I'm just trying to get through my day. I want, I want now some I good services. Respect. I want some. Woo! Hey, you let them treat you like a nigga in that store, not me. I don't go to places that treat me like a nigga. First of all, you're going to hear about it when it happened, and then I ain't coming back. Huh. Y'all weirdos. L.A. niggas is weirdos. Man. This this, I, this is what I noticed. Y'all got that dumbass gang culture. Y'all run around trying to be half Mexicans half the time. Let them talk to you in your kind of way. You know, some old black and brown bullshit. Meanwhile, they do everything in their power from City Hall on down to move you out the fucking way. Then you wonder why you get mistreated all the fucking time. All these gang members, all these bullets lying around, they should be scared to mistreat a nigga on anything. Hey, we talked to this dude's grandma wrong and a bunch of bullets came through the window. That's how it should be. I mean, y'all want violence? Make the violence uh, worthwhile at least. And that's when, uh, that's that Tupac. Korea killed uh, Latasha Har- Harland or whatever. That's that's. She shouldn't have no store no more. Oh no, that that store, yeah, that store has gone. It, 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 it there was no more store after that. So. I saw that afternoon. It, it probably happened, you know, that that fast. It probably did. What, did, did it close up or did it burn down? Probably both. No, it, well, yeah, it 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 was it probably was burned down during the riots, but the riots did occur one year later. I don't, but I don't think could you could you patronize a place where a murder? took place knowing that it was you niggas had no pride about nothing of course y'all did hey man this is this, this my corner store I, I, I gotta go here you know uh, you know I gotta get my lotto ticket you know, I gotta get my squares Damn. but see how really, if black people had pride there wouldn't be no Koreans in the neighborhood anyway off top you done had 30 40 years of these people talking to you in the old kind of way 30, 40 years of them shortchanging you, giving you bullshit products in dirty ass stores. Black that's people the, just like mistreatment. That's the Tupac energy. That's the Tupac. That's what Pac was about. Pac was a leader, was a fighter. Pac said, got to get, uh, get your guns and ammo, stockpile it, you know. That was his answer. He was like, get ready, get ready for war. And he even fired he was he was he was quick to pick up a gun if he saw a black man getting harassed he picked up a gun and he fired at the harasser on more than you know one or two occasions that was two pox that was that was pox uh stance bread and and built uh 
you know, from the uh, the, the Panther uh, lineage. But not all of us were built that way. And we even had our, you know, the Panther organization, you know, dismantled and destroyed from outside forces because they didn't want. Yeah, because America is anti-black. And everything that they do is anti-black. So, yeah, of course, the, the uh, Black Panthers were dismantled. Uh, Cointel Pro still goes on to this day. All of that shit. So there's not a... America is a right-wing country. Like, we pretend right. like there's a left and a right divide or whatever. No, it's not. If you study American politics from outside of America, America is a, uh, a right-wing country. No matter who's in power. If you look at any, if you look at our history, of all the countries and all the uh, dictators we put in place, we never put a left-wing one in. They've always been right-wing strongmen because that's our orientation. Yeah, and that's the way it seemed like it was going to be until Obama was in office, because there were Obama. always white Republicans. Are you kidding? Not saying that that he was any different or changed anything. Just saying that it seemed like it was always going to be, you know, a white, uh, a white person in power, and that everything, every, and that white was right. But we seem to have some some leeway. Some uh, a white person was in power when Obama was in charge. Who are you referring to? Obama. Obama was the white man. <laughs> he Obama well, is the white man. Oh, well, Ameri- you, okay. American Obama society is, is elitist. Obama by a racist white man. What does that got to do with black America? Um, um, America is an elitist society. He was so. raised by a racist white man in Hawaii. What does that have to do with black America? Nothing. Who was his race? Who was who raised him? Who are you referring to? His grandfather. Hmm. His grandfather was an out and out racist. Uh, yeah, there was that story about his grandfather about to say nigger, and he looked and he was like, Obama's here. I can't. Uh oh. <laughs> and the grandmother, yeah, yeah, you're right. Because the grandmother was like, uh, go soft, but don't, you know, don't say that and don't be like that. And your, your grandfather didn't mean that, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he harbored, he definitely harbored those feelings and, 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 yeah, those ideals, yeah. So it's nothing about Obama that has anything to do with the African-American experience. His college years, nothing. Until he was in his 30s, there's no real uh, evidence that he was even around black people until he was already a lawyer in Chicago. Well, no, he had a... I don't think it was the no. I, I think there was a brother that uh, in high school or college that you know. High school in Hawaii. Uh, it was must have been college then. They, he he referred to the the conversations he and his buddy were talking, and they were actually talking about you know um, what Jones and on uh, sisters and or girl or white girls, and they were they were having a little discussion. He wrote about it in his book and and uh, okay. But anyway, Obama was a grand distraction. <laughs> Nothing changed. The things that uh uh let, let's see, did the wars change? No. He he's supposed to be a black man, right? He went to Flint in front of those people and pretend to drink their water. He didn't really drink it. That's how disrespectful he was. You know, look at them in the eye and sip on the water and then put that glass right the fuck down. <laughs> Y'all love Obama. Obama don't love you. All that support y'all gave him, what did you get for it? The gays got something. The Jews got something. The Latinos got something. What you get? All right, man. Now, that same black man who was at the um, at the at the store today said that uh, the reason why that cashier upset him is because he was he demanded a 
maybe a law enforcement or some sort of military discount and she wouldn't give it to him because his he didn't brandish his ID but he said that he was already in the system he was a regular customer and all she had to do was check the system anyhow 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 and then um, he walked outside the door and then I followed him after I finished and I said hey man you know it's interesting that you had a problem at this store I had a problem too black man black man and black man so you just mentioned about the gays uh during obama's watch you know, let's something. go back to this dumb ass store but no but but the I, point the I point i don't give a fuck about that uh nigga not getting uh 10 percent off of some desk job he had in the military a million years ago fuck but that dude but the point i'm like, a, we, we both work in korea right yeah every nigga over the age of 18 even fucking bts Worldwide pop stars, they got to go serve in that bullshit military for two years. Yeah, everybody got to do it. Yeah. So nobody uh, say nothing about it. Ain't no special discounts. Meanwhile, these dudes do uh, advanced ROTC uh, for two years, and they want somebody sucking their dick for the rest of their lives, R- scrounging around for discounts and shit. Uh, you got your car with you? Nah. All right. Leave it at that. But what? what it's in the system. What this dude whining about? So he said he's oh, bitch ass dude. he said he's a, a, a policeman. He does detail for celebrities, celebrity security and whatnot. But here's what he said, because you mentioned the gays getting their rights um, under Obama, et cetera, et cetera. So he was like, he just he just cut to the chase. He was like, and I, I tried to tell him about Tupac. I said, man, Tupac stood up for the brothers and I saw you having an issue and I had an issue in this um in this store so i wanted to stick up for you like tupac and see what the hell was going on and he just went cut straight to the chase and he was just like nah man uh tupac was gay and then he went in and he said uh all these celebrities and the whorehouse culture that you know is being spewed on uh Nicki minaj and he said alicia keys is gay and uh he was talking about 50 cent is gay and he was saying no 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 he uh we one of them niggas. I know, and I was like, "What? Wait, wait!" I was like, "Man, everybody gay." I said, "Bro, why are we talking Unless about this?" Suck a dick. I don't want to hear. <laughs> I was like, like, "So why was you in the room while he was sucking dick?" I wasn't in no room while he was sucking dick. Shut the fuck up, then. You don't know, <laughs> right? You don't know. And I'm like, you just speculate like the rest of us. So I wanted to help the brother, but when he started talking like that, I was just like, "Oh man, this is." What the- and then I started to I started to suspect that he wasn't who he said he was, and that he was just trying to get a discount. And I was and that's like, "That's all it was." Cause damn, the military niggas love uh, parading that uh, that uh, ID card they get. Hmm. They they whip that shit out in a minute, right next to their driver's license. So. I ain't never seen one of them dudes not have a shit. So they, they spend all day scrounging around with goddamn discounts. I'm a veteran. Man. So that's what happened, man, at that store. And that brother disappointed me in the end. Well, y'all are disappointed, so it's all good. Gotta make a way somehow through all of the, the murkiness and can't change and uh, how do we beat the system we we have to we have to grow our own food then if we if we can't pay if we patronize these these racist establishments and there's a story that i read about or saw about today in compton where they had a community garden the the lot where the garden was is being sold by the owner and the owner who's selling it didn't tell the gardeners didn't tell them the community is going to suffer if the new owner decides that they don't want these people trespassing on their their land or, or whatnot if if the if the new owner doesn't honor the agreement or or what have you of the previous owner and that's going to be right in Compton that's going to that's so that's detrimental that's detrimental to the lives and to the quality of um, the health and the food that these people receive from these uh, gardens. Or fuck them niggas. Because uh, what what kind of got? Bloods or Crips? Uh, primarily Bloods. Pyrus. Not Bloods. Okay, no, 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 no. They don't have Bloods. They have Pyrus. The, the Blood Gang does not... Um, 
that pretty much does not exist in Compton. It's the Pyrus. The Pyrus are red, but they they are adamant. They make sure that you, mm, yeah. Okay, whatever any nonsense street politics. These Pyrus niggas have made conservatively how many how many millions of dollars between let's say 1980 and 2020 out of selling drugs in um, Compton. What would you estimate? Selling drugs, rapping, and other ventures. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. All the not no. Let's, let's just let's just stick to illegal shit. How much money have they made doing illegal shit in Compton, in, inside the city of Compton? Would you estimate? Oh, I have no idea. Uh, they they were. Uh... Okay. Well, how much did that lot sell for? Uh, man, I didn't read the article. I just just saw the uh, the headline. It, it wasn't even an article. It was an Instagram post. So my point is, a few hundred thousand for the lot, I imagine. Right. So that's like maybe a year. Not even a year. That's maybe like a a month or two of illegal drug sales. My point is, they could have bought that lot a million times over if they cared at all about the health and welfare of that neighborhood. They don't. So why should they? Why should anybody care? The people who live in that neighborhood could have came together and bought that fucking lot. Black people got to keep uh, uh, stop uh, walking around with their hands out and their mouth poked out like "Whoa, is me? We can't do shit." No, you don't want to do shit. I bet you if you added up all the money that uh, Hennessy makes out of Compton, uh, it'd be more than enough to pay for that goddamn lot. You can't uh, uh, buy what you want and beg for what you need. Mm. If, if they health and welfare ain't uh, a priority to them, why should the new owners give a shit? But it's all business. Do business. It's too late to buy the lot, right? You think he'll lease it to you? Why, so you can grow your fucking vegetables? No, you want somebody to give you something for nothing. That's, that's why shit don't work. You're at 109 right now.